go over your Bibles to, um, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 11 to 15. And um, 2 Corinthians 5. And here's our sermon title today. It's um, Made New and Motivated. Made New and Motivated. Now that title um, leads us to a very important question. And the question uh, is this. And it is a good one. It is, um, what does motivate you? So think about that for a second and, and answer, answer it to yourself before God. What does motivate you? What, what, what motivates us? If, if, if you want an act of uh, humility and transparency, then I encourage you at some point today to grab someone who really knows you and loves you, spouse, really good friend, someone who cares for you. And it, now this takes humility, so our pride prevents us from this, but you genuinely can go up to them and ask them, a uh, hun or a friend or whoever, um, what would be, in your opinion, the thing that motivates me the most? Uh, what, do you, what would you say motivates me? Because whatever motivates us is what drives us. And what drives us is what moves us. In fact, you can look at our behavior, and very often you can see the evidence of how we live, how we behave, and you pull that back and our behavior comes from what inspires us. Our behavior comes from what convicts us. Our behavior come, it comes from um, what motivates us. So some examples of this are when we're motivated by hunger, uh, we move to the fridge. Fair? Fair? When we're um, motivated by achievement, we move towards hard work. When we're motivated by a, a pleasure, we move towards a self-fulfillment. It, it, it's what drives us. We're seeking to achieve the goals that motivate us. When we're motivated by uh, money or motivated by greed, then we move towards aspects of finances, of, of money. Here's a, here's a picture of a guy who was motivated by money. This was sent to me a couple of weeks ago. The person knew I love this kind of stuff. So here it is in a sermon now, which is so great. And if that's your motivation, that's your goal. If that's your motivation, that's your end result. I mean, this guy, his vision is set on here. He is set up with an apparatus that is only going to lead him to destruction and death. He doesn't see this, though, because he's so focused here. But if this is your only motivation, you cannot serve both God and money. Where your heart is, there your treasure is. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. If this is your motivation, that's the bottom line. What motivates you? What motivates us? What motivates me? When your motivation, here it is, when you are truly new, your motivation is to be the Lord Jesus Christ. When your motivation is the gospel, that inspires, that brings resolve, that brings action. When we are motivated by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we move towards him. See, one of the realities of being made new is when we're new creatures, new creations in Jesus Christ. When the old is gone and the new now has come, we are completely different people. And when we are made new by God himself, that should turn our motivations upside down. A case in point to this is the Apostle Paul, who wrote 2 Corinthians on the idea of being made new called new creation. Before Jesus Christ, Paul's motivation, as he was walking on the road to Damascus, his motivation was to kill Christians and to stomp out the name of Jesus Christ. He is confronted, though, by the grace of God, by the light of Jesus Christ. His eyes are open. The scales are lifted. He literally goes from death to life. He is made new. He is a new creation. Everything changes. He can now see. He knows why he lives. His motivations completely take a 180 degree, uh, degree turn in that moment. And no longer is he trying to kill Christians. He's trying to birth Christians. No longer is he trying to stomp out Jesus Christ. He now gives his whole life for the cause of Jesus Christ. Christ to the point he will die for Jesus Christ because he has been made new. He is made new. He can see. When he can see, he begins to live. His motivations are fundamentally and absolutely changed. Let me ask you what motivates you? What drives us? What motivates us? Again, what motivates us? And if we're made new, then our answers should line up with Paul's, let's find out if they do. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. 
Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, Paul says, there's a motivation, we persuade others. What we are is known to God. He knows our hearts. I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Notice the contrast, outward appearance and then heart. Verse 13, For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. Verse 14, here's our motivation. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one, Christ has died for all, therefore all believers have died. And he died for all, Christ died for all, that those who live, this is awesome, might no longer live for themselves, but for Christ, for him, but for him, hey, 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 this is the calling of life. Right here, that phrase, but for him, but for him, but for him, it's everything, it's everything. But for him, notice, who for their sake, who for their sake uh, uh, died and was raised. What motivates you? What motivates you? Well, if we're made new, then we have different motivations, and we're going to find out what they are right now. Here's motivation number one. If we are made new, then we are motivated in the fear of the Lord. We are motivated in the fear of the Lord. Look again at verse 11. It says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but what we are is known to God. Let's just stop right there for a second. Now, as we come to verse 11, um, that means we have just left verse 10. Fair? And verse 10 speaks of impending judgment for all believers. Remember that from last week? If you weren't here, I'll bring you up to speed. Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All believers at the end of time will have to give an account before God what we did with what's been entrusted to us. All of us have been given in Christ abilities and gifts and a stewardship over our lives, and we will all stand before Christ at the judgment seat and have to give an account. This is where we will find out, are we gathering hay and straw? Our works of hay and straw will be burned up in the fire. That's works of self. That's works that weren't for the glory of God. But then if we have works for the Lord and pure, they will be gold and silver and precious stones, and those things will survive the fire of judgment. So Paul knows this. And because he knows this, and God is a God of justice, and, and God means what he says, this produces in him a fear of the Lord. Now, you want to talk about motivation. Verse 11 is, is tremendous motivation. Verse 10 is unbelievable motivation. Now, Paul's a wise man. Are you wise? Am I wise? Here's how we know if we're wise. What Paul is constantly doing, the wise person is constantly discerning between what's eternal and what's temporary. I can't tell you how many times a day I have this conversation in my mind of that's eternal, that's temporal. That will last forever, that will die. That, that is what honors Christ, that does not honor Christ. I can't tell you how often, again, wisdom is constantly looking at the world and saying, I could do that, but that's, that, that just, there's no point. I can do this and Christ will be honored. The wise person is looking through life. What do I desire? What is my ambition? Why do I want this success? Is this success rooted in me or is this success rooted in, in the glory of God? Is this about me? Is this about the Lord? Hey, children, don't listen to that. That's a lie. Hey, children, don't follow that. That's a lie from the world. Children, look at Christ. He's the one who lasts. The world is a bunch of baloney and will not last. Jesus Christ is everything. He is glorious. The wise person is constantly discerning all the time, what is eternal, what is temporary. The fear of the Lord is what gives us wisdom to look through this world and to try to discern that within our lives. You see in verse 11, the word knowing. He says, knowing the fear of the Lord. Now, this isn't just gaining information. This word is um, I'm literally, in the original, appreciating so appreciating the fear of the Lord, valuing the fear of the Lord. See what's happening here? I mean, this is what's so um, interesting. The icon's on the stage here. So when we are made new, when we are made new, we have new hope, new bodies. New bodies are coming. And we are made new, we have a new vision. Walk by faith, not by sight. Right? We, 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 we see differently. But here's one of the tests. If we are truly made new and we see differently, then we must live differently. Because the heart here represents if we are made new, we have new passion. We have a new motivation. We have, we have a new reason to live. So question right now, question right now. Are you made new? Are you made new? If you're made new, you see. You have to see. And if you see, you live differently. 
Paul says, appreciating the fear of the Lord, knowing this, we persuade others. I see what's true. I live differently in light of what's true. What motivates us? Do you really see? Do we really see? If we really see, it changes how we live. Is your life different? Does your life prove that you've been made new in Jesus Christ? Is there evidence that the Spirit of God is working within you as you desire not the world, but the things of the Lord Jesus Christ for His glory? Is your life and mind filled with self-pursuit and self-glory? Because that's evidence we're not made new. But if we truly see, then we will live differently. And we will live in the reality of the fear of the Lord. And when Paul says he appreciates or values the fear of the Lord, this isn't Paul and filled with terrible fright of God. This isn't Paul filled with a human fear, I'm so scared what's going to happen. This is a reverential awe in light of coming judgment, but also the holiness and the wonder and the glory of his God. Paul knows, I have to give an account for my life. God will measure me on this. So the fear of the Lord then sobers him, fuels him, it motivates him. Listen, it makes him wise. So, of course, then Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, tell me, wisdom. Yes, wisdom. The fear of the Lord is, so what I do when I read scripture, often you take a verse and what it says, but then what does it, what is it saying in the opposite? Conversely, then, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a removal of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of foolishness. Yes. Do you want to be a fool? I hope not. You don't want to be a fool, but you need wisdom. How do you get wisdom? The fear of the Lord. Think about all the lives, though. They don't live in the fear of the Lord, and they forfeit wisdom. Think about the churches that forsake the fear of the Lord, and therefore they forfeit the wisdom of God. What does the fear of the Lord bring to our lives? The fear of the Lord brings clarity, coming judgment. The fear of the Lord brings glory, the glory of God. The fear of the Lord brings focus. The fear of the Lord then brings wisdom we can see. But if you remove the fear of the Lord, you lack clarity, you lack focus, you lack resolve, you lack worship, honestly. This is why John Murray said this about the fear of the Lord. He said, the highest reaches of sanctification, that's a big word for becoming more like Jesus Christ, are only realized in the fear of the Lord. The highest reaches of fruitfulness for Christ are only realized in the fear of the Lord. Therefore, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you will not you will always butt up against the ceiling in your walk with Jesus Christ. So recently I went to a building. I was trying to get to the eighth floor. I walked into an elevator. I quickly found out it only went to the fourth floor. As long as I stay in that elevator, I will hit a ceiling. I can only go up so far. So many believers are living lives absent of the fear of the Lord. They only go so far. So many churches, organizations, they don't have a fear of the Lord. They can only go to floor four. If I'm going to get to where I'm supposed to be, I get out of that elevator, I find the one that goes to the eighth, I get in, and then I can reach my potential of where God wants me to be. If we're going to see the fruit that God wants to show in our lives, we must be living lives in the fear of the Lord in a church that honors Him, because then and only then we will see the highest reaches of sanctification if we understand how powerful and how motivational the fear of the Lord actually is. And this is why Paul says in the rest of, of verse 11, if you look at there, he says, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. So Paul is saying here, he's like, listen, listen, our motives are the fear of God, and God knows this to be true. So he's saying in verse 11, God knows this to be true, and he's like, hey, church of Corinth, I hope you know this to be true. But God knows our hearts. What we are is known to God. Our incentive is in the fear of the Lord. And so notice what Paul's doing here. This is what's so key lesson for us. You can seek to please God and persuade men in the gospel, or you can seek to please men and persuade God. I'm going to put that on the screen because it's important enough to do so, okay? Look at this. You can seek to please God, the fear of the Lord, and then persuade men as to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love the Lord, I revere the Lord, I know His word is true, He is who matters, so I take this resolve and I persuade men towards God. The other alternative is, though, 
or you will seek to please man because you want to be accepted here and now. You want people to like you. We want to fit in with the world. We want acceptance from our culture, but we please man. But then we're forced to come up to God and say, well, God, what you really meant to say was in this teaching. Well, God, I know what you said, but can, can, you, can you switch it? Can we find ways to soften that so people will like us more? Do you see what happens? If we seek to fear men, we have to start changing God in a sense. We have to try to persuade him to say something he didn't say. And that's when life starts to bottom out. That's when the power of God starts to leave the church. Because God is not interested in a culture of man. He's interested in the fear of him. He's interested in his power and his glory. So, what's our motivation? Are we motivated by the fear of man? Or are we motivated by the fear of God? Tell me, tell me, why are, why are so many churches taking the edge off certain doctrines? Why are so many churches telling more stories than Scripture? Why are so many Christian organizations trying to be liked and accepted by the public? Why are church leaders capitulating to culture? Why is the gospel message increasingly in our day being softened and turned? The answer is because the motivation is the fear of man. And to think of the judgment that is coming that those will have to stand before and say, I fear to speck when in contrast to the glory of the sovereign Lord who will make us give an account of what we did with his word and his glory. This is why Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, on this thing he says this, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? And there's the question. I mean, actually, what motivates us? Are we motivated by the approval of man or the approval of God? Are we afraid of what people think? Are we motivated in, in human acceptance? And Paul says, or am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Look at the consequences of what's happening here. If we spend our lives in the fear of man, on some level, we are not true servants of Jesus Christ. What motivates us? Paul is deeply motivated by the fear of the Lord, which causes him to persuade others as to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because in the end, he knows all that matters is what God says and what God thinks. Motivation number two. This is motivated within opposition. Motivated within opposition. Isn't it true in life? Isn't it true in life that strong opposition can result in tremendous motivation? Strong opposition can result in tremendous motivation. Now, now, now why is that true? Because when we're opposed, when we feel the threat of opposition, it will often bring focus and clarity, and again, resolve, okay? Think of soldiers. When soldiers are at peace and the enemy is way far off, what happens? They relax, they play cards, they joke around, as they should. They're resting. But when the enemy draws near, the soldiers become vigilant. The soldiers are so awake. The soldiers have hand on the trigger, ready to go, because they know this is about life and death. They are not lazing around. They are not sleeping. They are not joking. They are alert. It's the reality of opposition that brings tremendous motivation upon their lives. Let's drop into a spiritual example, the persecuted church. The persecuted church, so often the church in the Western world, because things for a while have been so easy and we get complacent, we sit around and we argue about the color of the carpet. We just argue about whether or not we're doing what we want to do and we're in the position we want to be becomes about us. We're, we're, we're arguing about, about how worship style should be. It's just so ridiculous in light of everything else that's happening. But when the opposition comes for the persecuted church and it's so there, they're not fighting with one another. They're focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. They know their mission. They can see so clearly. Man, they don't care about the color of the carpet. They have carpet at all. They're just trying to see lives change for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the opposition that brings their lives into such clarity, focus, and resolve. Paul, in the church of Corinth, had detractors, opponents, and enemies that were trying to attack him on any angle they could get. Anything he said, they tried to twist and make it say something he wasn't saying. They were trying to discredit him. They were trying to cause his character to be blemished. That's tough. Now that could either discourage him greatly or he could use the opposition to further motivate him for the purposes and the cause he had for Jesus Christ. Again, look at verse 12. Verse 12, it says, We are not commending ourselves to you, again, but giving you cause to boast about us, that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Now, 
the very fact that Paul begins verse 12 with, we are not commending ourselves, leads us to believe that this is the very thing he was being accused of. Again, again, his opponents attacking his integrity, attacking his motives, undermining him at every turn. So what Paul does, he says in verse 11 and 12, he says, listen, God knows who we are. I hope you do too. But I'm giving, I, I'm giving you the authority, Corinthian church, that you can get our backs, that you can turn and you can defend us because you know what we're doing and why we're doing it. We are doing this for the glory of God and the fear of the Lord. It's within the opposition. He says, listen, my conscience is clean. I have nothing to hide. I submit myself to you. But watch what's happening here within verse 12 because you can miss it. The opposition is refining the unity that Paul seeks to have within the church. Paul's like, you got my back? You got my back? But the opposition comes, I gotta know what you got my back. When opposition comes upon us as a church, the small things fade away, and all, I've seen this over a period of 12 years in this church, and at different times, in different ways, it has been awesome. When the opposition comes in different ways, spiritual, whatever, physical, the way the church comes, and, and the way we're arm in arm, all of a sudden, all those other things, it just, we're together for the cause of Jesus Christ. The vision now is clear. The motivation is so strong. And then to feel so supported with brother and sister, arm in arm, walking forward in prayer because we see it. We know why we exist. We know our purpose. And it's for the Lord. And again, all the other things fall to the side. It's such a powerful place to be. What motivates us? What motivates us? The opposition that can come against us, as much as it may be discouraging, it can be very, very much a fuel for the source of seeing so clearly and living so powerfully. And then don't miss in verse 12 as well. In verse 12, his enemies, the enemies of Paul, are all about the outward appearance. You see that? And so Paul takes the foolish aim of his enemies to simply reinforce what matters most. He, he reinforces the heart. So, so, watch this, watch this. When we are filled with wisdom, we will be wise when we allow opposition to only sharpen our spiritual vision. That's what Paul does. He's like, we're about the heart, man. They want outward appearance. We're about the heart. Church, we're going for the heart, the things that last, eternal, not temporal, right? Outward appearance, temporal, heart, eternal. So two things can happen when we are opposed. When we are opposed, we can either stoop to the level of our detractors or we can rise above in life to the level of Christ. Let me ask you, are you like me when people oppose you? Is your first instinct to be like, oh yeah? People threaten you, people do this, people, and you're like, oh, I'll show you. I'll show you who's got problems. Is that your first day? Anyone, anyone else like that in the room today? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Hmm, three of us together. We'll get after the, we'll go hang out. Thank you, Cole. Three more over here. And your instinct in your flesh, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. It's amazing though with the love of Christ, the opposition come against us and to allow us to not stoop to the level but to rise above and to say, how can I love in this situation? George Whitfield, he's one of my spiritual heroes. I recently read his biography again. I read it about 10 years ago and I read it again about six months ago. I was so impacted by it. Now he was one of the most fruitful preachers ever, okay? Like ever. <laughs> I was so powerfully used. I was so impressed when, when he was, and he got attacked a ton because he was so powerfully used. The enemy, people, so jealous, just the venom, just constantly taking everything he said, just like Paul, and trying to twist it. What he did, though, is I was so amazed by this. Every time he was attacked, the first thing he did, he got on his knees and he prayed for the person who was attacking him. Now, that seems so basic. That's so Sermon on the Mount. That's so what Jesus tells us to do. I know, but again, what's our instinct most of the time? Our instinct isn't that. Our instinct is to defend ourselves. But Whitfield, he turned and he prayed for the person who was attacking him to love them. So I was reading this and my mind was renewed in this. I'm like, wow, that's pretty neat. I should try that. Hey, I really commend it to you. It's quite something. So when you get attacked and someone comes and you feel like, you know, unjustly, whatever. And sometimes there's legitimacy to this, of course. But your first response is to be like, Lord, I pray for this individual. I pray love upon this individual. That's amazing. It worked. Like, like, like things happened. It amazed me. Just to see when, when the opposition comes, where does it put our focus? On self? On self-defense? On other people? On other people's sins? Or can it fuel our motivation for the love of Christ to see us more powerfully used in our lives in the way that Jesus Christ intended? 
What motivates us? Self, Christ. Then verse 13, look at verse 13. This is great. He says, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Now this verse tells us that Paul's opponents were accusing him of being mad, crazy, insane. He was out of his mind. If we are beside ourselves, they were telling people Paul has lost his mind, out of his senses. He was a madman speaking foolishness. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was accused of the very same thing? He was mad. He had demons. But see, Paul is so passionate and zealous for the Lord. He was determined and he had such resolve. But listen, listen, the world could not understand it, so then they dismissed it as madness. One more George Whitfield story. George Whitfield, on the Sunday after his ordination where he preached, okay, so powerfully used, the people in the village where he preached, they complained to the bishop that George Whitfield had caused 15 people to become insane. Now they complained to the, to, the, to the bishop, and the bishop was a godly man, and the bishop said, I wish all clergy had this effect on people as opposed to none at all. Now, 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 here's one of the signs that you are made new. Ready? It's good. One of the signs that God is at work in your life and you are truly made new is that some people, not all, some people will look at your life and say, you're nuts. You're crazy. And what's our response to that? Our response is, amen, to the glory of God. Let me ask you, are there some people in your life that think you're crazy for Jesus? That's a good sign, loved ones. If we're walking around in our lives and no one thinks we're nuts for Jesus and we're fitting with every situation and everywhere we go, we just kind of just resemble everything around us, that's a really, really bad sign. Like that's a really, we're not salt and light. We're becoming whatever it's around us. On some level, if we think everyone's going to like us because we love Jesus, we don't know the Bible. At some point, especially in our world today, to be fired up for the Lord Jesus Christ, and you express that, and you articulate that, people will look at you and say to your face or behind your back, that person is messed up. And we say, praise the Lord, right? <laughs> but that's hard. But listen, it's one of the signs, it's one of the signs our motivations are in the right place. And this is Paul right here, and what Paul is doing, he's summarizing verse 13, he says, whether you call me insane or I'm of sound mind, it's for God's glory, or for the love of God's people, for God's glory as well. I want you to see this too. Okay, watch. Paul's so attacked, okay? He's so um, constantly being, being, you know, trying to get distracted, but because his motivation is so clear, because he's made new, and new vision, and his passion is so real, he's so set on where he's going, to glory with Christ, with the gospel, he's walking, and people keep trying to throw arrows at him and distract him, and if he's not motivated on Christ, he will get distracted and say, hey, that hurts. Why are you doing that? That's not fair. You shouldn't do that to me. How dare you? I'm going to defend myself. And he's, notice, notice, his goal is here, but he's turned now, and he's focusing on the horizontal. And he goes, hey, you can't do that. I'm going to defend myself. Hey, you can't. But he loves Christ so much, he plows through the distractions. He's plowing his motivation, plows away all the people that would hurt. He's like, hey, you can say what you want, but you're just a man, okay? You're just a man. The best of men are men at best, and you're not the best of men. You're actually a worse man, and the worst men are just worse, all right? So, so he says that, and he says, but you're just a man, and last time I checked, I'm a child who belongs to God. I'm a child of the king. I cannot die. I will win. I belong to him. God is the one who's in control. You can say what you want. I belong. I win. Christ loves me in your face person, okay? Okay? This is what the gospel does. It plows through. I'm so set on Christ. Say what you want, people. I belong to Jesus. And I keep walking and not get unnecessarily distracted by the things the enemy wants to use to take me down. What motivates you? What motivates you? If we're motivated by self-glory, then these will distract us all the time because it makes it about us. But when it's about the Lord... We're just like, whatever, whatever, people, whatever. Love you, but, but I'm living for Jesus. <coughs> motivation within opposition. Here's the third motivation. This is the granddaddy of them all. It's this. It's the motivation of the love of Christ. Motivated by the love of Christ. Hey, are you made new? Are you motivated? 
be motivated by what's true. Verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Now when Paul says the word for here in verse 14, he's moving from one motivation to the next. Notice this, okay? For the love of Christ controls us. I want to be clear here. This is not our love for Christ. This is Christ's love for us. Think about it. The motivation of the gospel is the love of God. The initiation of the gospel is the love of God. Maybe you've heard of this verse before, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. The love of God initiated the gospel of the son of God coming to the earth to live, die, and be raised from the dead. The love of God, it's, it's Christ's love for us that controls us. It's not our love for Christ. Our love is in response to Christ's love for us. So again, again, think of the theology. It's awesome. When we are made new, are you made new? Are you made new? Are you alive in Jesus Christ? How do you know? How do you know? When we are made new in Jesus Christ, we receive a blood transfusion of Christ into us. His blood, his love flows through our entire spiritual body. When we are made new, his leaven leavens us completely. The, the, the leaven of the love of Christ completely fills our entire spiritual body. When we are made new in Christ, the love of God saturates us. It fills us. It controls us. It guides us. It, it recreates us. It regenerates us. The love of Christ at salvation completely changes us. It fills every part, again, of us. No wonder Paul then says, the love of Christ controls us. Now the verb control here in verse 14 is a wonderful examination. It carries two basic meanings. I want you to pay attention to this. This is very important. What does control mean? We all have our own ideas of control that we conjure up, but there's a sense in which this verb control uh, means the love of Christ constrains us or it protects us, okay? So think about it. Someone who's made new by the gospel, completely saturated by God's love, they now begin a journey to Christ in glory that they are not in control of. The love of Christ has set them free from the penalty of sin. They are now walking a path of becoming more like Christ and what God has started, he will finish. The love of Christ, therefore, saves us, constrains us, protects us from dying to sin, death, or Satan's grasp. When we are his and filled with love, we will never lose this love. The love of Christ will take us all the way from here, all the way into glory, guaranteed. In this sense, the love of Christ guides, guards us, constrains us, protects us from dying to our own sin. It, it carries us all the way. The love of Christ, it, it constrains us. But the other sense of this is that the word control, the love of Christ controls us, is that it compels us. And some translations use that word as well. In this sense, the love of Christ compels us. It brings urgency. There's a compulsion within us, right? So, 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 look here, look here, look here, look here. The love of Christ saturates us, not so we stay dormant or static. The love of Christ sets us on a journey, and in that journey, the love in us is told to go uh, uh, out through us. We don't hold it in, we share it. We, we, we long for people to know the love that we have in Jesus Christ. We want the lost to be found and the, and the dead to come alive. It's the love of Christ then that compels us that gives us urgency and, and passion for the love of God to be seen again in others. So as we think about the season coming up for us as a church, a very big season, we think about this fourth service. What is, what is my motivation for a fourth service? So my greatest motivation for a fourth service is the opportunity to share the love of Christ. It's, it's the love of Christ compels me. It compels others us, that there are so many people out there dead and dying and lost in sin and right now destined for hell. 
And apart from the love of Christ, they don't stand a chance. So if we can open up a few more seats and provide opportunity for them to come here and be saved and discipled and then nourished in the word and the love, that, that's what compels us. For the people here, right, why would you serve and harvest kids during this season where there's such need? You serve and harvest kids because the love of Christ compels you. Not so you feel guilty. Not so someone will say, well, way to serve or God will pat you on the back. No, because you love the Lord. And the love of God in you wants to come from you. Why do we serve on the welcome team during this season of need? Not so we can just shake hands and feel good about ourselves. Because the love of Christ compels us to. We want to make our lives count. We want to give ourselves. Why do we give to the kingdom of God? We give because the love of Christ compels us to take God's resources and multiply that for the kingdom of God elsewhere. Why do we have a heart for the lost? Because the love of Christ compels us. It compels us. There's compulsion. If we are made new, loved ones, there should be something bubbling right now. There should be a, a temperature rising in our spiritual lives. We're hearing this saying, yes, 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 yes. Why would someone move from the Sunday morning services to Saturday night where the new service is opening up and leave a seat open here to take a seat there? The love of Christ compels you to do so. Because you say, if I can just move services and go to Saturday night so a seat is open that someone can come in and hear the message and be saved and be equipped in the things of Christ, the love of Christ compels me to consider going to Saturday night. For the love of Christ, it controls us. It, it compels us. It constrains us. What's your motivation? What's my motivation? This is to be our motivation. Are we made new? Are we made new? If we're made new, we're motivated. Motivated by the fear of the Lord. Motivated within opposition. Motivated by the love of Christ. And then fourthly this, we're, we're motivated through a new ambition. A new ambition. Look at verse 14, second half says, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Oh God, I pray right now you would help. You would help us to see, maybe in a way we've never seen, in the, like in the name of Jesus Christ, give, give strength and grace for this moment to happen even right now. Just to understand all that this has been leading to. Look at the source of the motivation. Look at this. We have concluded this, that one, Christ has died for all. Therefore, all believers have died. Loved ones, notice what Paul's doing. He never tires of the gospel. The gospel is his fuel. Whatever it takes, read the gospel, sing the gospel, pray the gospel, share the gospel. He's constant. The whole point of his, the whole source of his motivation, it's right here in verses 14 and 15. It's the gospel. One has died for all, that those who have died with Christ may no longer live for themselves, but live for him, but for him, but for him, but for him. What does it mean that Christ died and therefore all have died? It means that when, when Christ died, believers, we died with him. Our old self was crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live. My, my, my flesh has been crucified. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Don't you see? When we place our faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, our sins, our old self, the penalty of our sin is crucified with Christ. It dies with Christ on the cross which then frees us now to live for Christ in, 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 in true and ultimate freedom. The penalty of sin, dead. Old self, dead on the cross. And the sinful flesh, his, his days are numbered, praise the Lord. His days are numbered when that will be all said and done. And the very presence and power of sin will be completely destroyed as well. So you see, ready? You see. When Christ dies on the cross for our sins... This is the death of death in the death of Christ. I want you to get this. When Christ dies for our sins on the cross, this is the death of death. 
through the death of Christ. That's why, Lord willing, our text next week, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The old self is crucified. But behold, the new has come. The new has come. New creations. And why? Because Christ has died for all, therefore all have died. So all those who trust in Christ, their old self is crucified, but now they are free to live for Christ. Don't you see? May new, your motivations completely change. Everything's different now. And I wonder who's here today where since this message started and the question has been asked, are you made new? And you're like, I don't think I am. Some of us have been playing a level of church for so many years, we've kind of dropped into a level of religion where it's just become routine. There's been no true relationship or heart. Let me ask you again, like what does motivate you? Do you know that you're alive? Do you know that you're made new? When Christ has died, we die with him. We die with him. We are now alive. Could it be that you are here today? That through all these years, God has sovereignly placed you in this service, that your heart might be called forth, that you might give your life to Jesus Christ, that you might say, Jesus, you are the Savior of my sins. I no longer want to live the way I have. I am tired of my sin. I am tired of my I'm tired of my I'm tired of death. I want to be made new that I might see that I might find life. Could it be that you are here today, right now? Because God has given you eyes to see for the first time that you might be called to live differently. Truly live differently. No more games. No more going through the motions. But alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why he died. You want another test of whether or not we're made new? Look at verse 15. Here it is. And he died, Christ died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him but for him. You want to say that? It's beautiful. But for him. You want to say it again? But for him. That's it. That's it. That's it. If we are made new, our motivations completely change. It's for him. It's for him. When I look at verse 15, my heart skips a beat. This is why I live. This is why I'm here. This, my, my flesh says, no, no, self, self. The Spirit of God in me says, yes, 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 yes. That he died for all, that I might no longer live for myself, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. If we truly understand the gospel, listen, 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 we can no longer live for ourselves. If we are truly made new, are you made new? Then we no longer live for ourselves. Does your life prove, does my life prove that we no longer live for ourselves? Do our lives indicate we do live for ourselves, indicating there's no true sense of spirit of God in us? What motivates you? And notice, notice the end of verse 15, it says, who for their sake died and was raised. Whose sake? Believer's sake, your sake, my sake. If we're saved in Jesus Christ, of course the word sake means purpose, ambition, and for your for your sake, your purpose, your ambition, your end, he died. This is amazing. Jesus Christ in love made us his ambition. And that's why he died and was raised. It's right here in the text. For your sake, Jesus Christ made us his ambition. Should we not then make him our ambition? Please, please, hear me, hear me. Jesus Christ died. He made us his ambition out of love. Should we not then make him our ambition? Some here right now, aren't you tired of living the Christian life halfway? Aren't you so sick and tired of getting a sense of what could be, but then falling back into the ways of the world over and over again? I mean, aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? What's it going to take? What will have to... Like you're here right now. Like, that's just what a blessing. You're here right now. You're listening to this word. You're, you're here right now confronted with truth and the love of God. And will you again turn away and just keep living the way that you have for all these years? Or could it be that God says two things? God says, one, you need to be made new. 
You've never been made new. You've never fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. Ever. But today could be your day. And could it be that you're a believer that at one point has, but you have been distracted by the things of the world, and God says, enough. What's it going to be? Are you in or are you out? What motivates us? If we are made new, we are motivated in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A powerful missionary named John Payton. He was about to travel to the New Hebrides Islands where there were cannibals on that island and former missionaries were killed and eaten by these cannibals. He was talking about his plan to travel there and one man who was advanced in age, a man, stood up and protested Peyton's traveling to the New Hebrides and this man said, the cannibals, the cannibals, you will be eaten by cannibals. And Peyton responded, he said, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave. They are to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus. It will make no difference to me whether I mean by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day, my resurrection body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. Praise the Lord for John Payton. Now, why could he say that? He could say that because his motivation was in the fear of the Lord. His, he was motivated with an opposition. He was motivated by the love of Christ. And he was motivated with an entirely new ambition. When our eyes are on the Lord and our eyes are on the gospel, everything changes and our lives begin to prove it. This was John Payton's life. And this is to be ours in some sense as well. What motivates you, loved ones? What motivates you? Today's a decision day. Today's an important day. I pray today's a turning point day. Let's pray. Let's pray. With faith right now, Father, I pray, and um, loved ones, I'm not in a rush right now at all. This world is chaotic and frantic and so busy. We will leave this place and we will be um, bombarded with all the activity. But right now, it is right to be still and know that He is God. Um, I encourage you and I ask you right now that you get your motivations and you put them on the table before the Lord. Uh, you might as well because He can see everything anyways. Nothing can be hidden from Him. His eyes see all. He sees every single heart perfectly, every single motive perfectly, every single desire perfectly. He sees it all. So I just encourage you strongly right now, put all your motivations on the table and to let Him do heart surgery upon you right now. For some of us right now, for some of us, we are um, attempting to do that. And um, we are seriously asking ourselves, am I made new? Have I really been um, regenerated by the Spirit of God? Are my motivations rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I know that He has set me free, that His love has filled my soul? Is there evidence in my life of, of love? Not, not, not perfection but of a growing appetite for the things of God? Am I made new? Have I ever fully and truly surrendered my life to Jesus Christ? Has that happened? And maybe you're here today and you've been playing the game for so long that you even forget kind of what's happened. But today, today, you, you want to know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ has set you free that Jesus Christ, that your sins are paid for, that the old is gone and the new has come. And so right now with heads appropriately bowed and with every Christian praying, praying, because this is a matter of life and death, God, would you be opening up eyes for the first time to truly see why we're here and what this life is really about. It's, it's you and it's for your glory. If you are here today and God is opening up your eyes and you desire life and you do not desire to die, that you want your sins to be put on the cross with Jesus Christ, that you might no longer live for yourself but for him who for your sake died and was raised. If you want life in Jesus Christ, 
and you believe in him and you in this moment give your love to him and you are saying Jesus set me free set me free if that is you today I ask you just to raise your hand where you are right now raise your hand in faith amen this is saying I want to be set free amen so many of you left right and center I want Jesus Christ to make me alive. I want to be saved from my sins. Anyone else here today, by faith, you are recognizing and acknowledging Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Bless your hearts. Bless your hearts. I love in these moments, I know nothing. Jesus knows everything. So he knows every life. He knows every situation. He knows every circumstance. And if your faith is real right now, you call out to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are, you are Lord. You are Savior. I am not. But you are Jesus. You forgive my sins. You have paid the price. You set me free. You caused me to be alive. Lord Jesus, I invite you. Take over. Pray this prayer right now. Take over. Take over. Let me see. Let me live. I embrace your love. Bless you with those hands raised. You can put your hands down right now. And the second thing I want to do right now is this. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and for too long you've been going through the motions and for too long mediocrity and apathy and lethargy has, has taken you captive but today you're saying enough enough of partial Christianity enough of partial love enough of hypocrisy enough of this and the love of Christ compels you to more that is you today, and you truly, truly desire to be a turning point for Christ in your life. Like truly, truly, you mean this. And you don't, you don't care what anyone else thinks around you because this is about the Lord. You don't give, you don't give a rip about what someone else says or thinks. This is, this is you and God right now. If you desire more from your life and you want this day to be a turning point day by the grace of God, I ask you in the seriousness of this moment to stand. Don't stand unless you mean it. If you mean it, stand. Jesus, take over. Don't stand unless you mean it, okay? This is a full resolve right now. I haven't been who you want me to be and I desire right now for a greater capacity by the grace of God. Do not stand unless you mean it. But if you mean it, by all means, you stand to the Lord, acknowledging Him. This isn't man, this is Him. Amen. 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 If you mean it, stand. He is so worthy. He is so worthy that we might no longer live for ourselves, but for Him, but for Him, but for Him. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I pray for every heart standing right now for the glory of you fill them. God, I pray the repentance of sin is so real. And I pray, oh God, the grace of God is washing them clean again. And they have an affection stirring up in them right now, as new as ever, as vibrant as ever, as real as ever. And God, I beg you that the world will be seen for what it is, temporal garbage but the glories of Jesus Christ will be seen as the riches that will last into all of eternity. O oh, Father, have mercy on us sinners. Cause us, Lord, in the fear of the Lord to reach the highest of heights in Jesus Christ. Cause us, Lord, to such an affection of love and passion for you. Cause us, Lord, to live for the only purpose worth living for. That's you. Lord, give your dear saints a new song to sing, a song as loud as ever, and a song that will last forever. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Let's all stand together. Let's sing as loud as